the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, today, uh, 5 December, is a ferial day, uh, so it's the season of Advent, uh, but it happens to land on a Saturday, and so it's permitted during Advent to celebrate um, on one Saturday what's called a Rorate Mass, and that is um, the Mass of our, uh, the Blessed Virgin on Saturdays during the time of Advent. And this is a very beautiful Mass. It's said uh, before dawn and, and uh, um, with candles only. So it's uh, actually quite a, quite a beautiful Mass, uh, you know, all in the dark. Uh, people are holding candles, a candlelit altar, and especially a high Mass. Uh, we can get a good choir with a chant. Uh, very, very beautiful Mass indeed. Uh, in fact, I just, I just, we had one this morning, and uh, uh, one of the parishioners told me, a recent, uh, uh, they started coming here from the Novus Ordo said it was like a piece of heaven on earth. Absolutely amazing. She, she loved it, never seen anything like it. So, uh, I don't know, it's a, sign of, a sign of the future, I suppose. Uh, anyway, uh, I will not actually be speaking about that, the Rorate Mass, or in fact, or any saint uh, of today, because I wish to speak about the saint for tomorrow, and that is St. Nicholas of Myra. Uh, his feast is December 6th this year. That's on a Sunday. And so rather than uh, skipping him this year, I will go ahead and speak about him a little bit today. So the Nicholas of Myra, uh, born at the end of the 3rd century, and um, would um, his parents had died when he was young, uh, and they left him quite a large fortune, and St. Nicholas used it uh, to give away to, mo- um, to, to, the, to the poor. Um, he was cared for by his uncle, uh, who was also um, uh, an ecclesiastic, and his uncle saw to it that Nicholas was ordained a priest. And so... Um, St. Nicholas, there's the, um, the legend of St. Nicholas, right? And this is, this is Santa Claus, by the way. Like, yes, St. Nicholas of Myra, this is where Santa Claus comes from, you know, Sinterklaas, Santa, it's, it's all, it means Saint, St. Nicholas, right? So um, the, the legend of where Santa Claus, the giver of gifts, come from is as a priest, uh, there was a poor man who had three daughters, and he had actually been wealthy, uh, but had lost his fortune, and so he was unable to marry his daughters off in the proper way. Uh, right, they had had to give a dowry, and so Saint Nicholas, uh, with his own right, that that leftover fortune, you could say, from his parents, uh, secretly went at night so as not to, um, you know, humiliate the man, and threw a sack of coins in in the window for uh, his oldest daughter to be married, and he actually did this uh, two other times for the other daughters, and the third time the man stayed awake. He he wanted to know who was doing this, and he caught Saint Nicholas doing it uh, the third time. So. Uh, that, 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 thus, we have the legend of St. Nicholas the Gift Giver, which has endured for 17 centuries now. Uh, so fantastic. Um, you, you never know, right, what, what one example, one act of generosity can do. And here, the, here we are 1,700 years later, uh, and everybody yeah, knows who, who St. Nicholas is. Well, I take it back. They know the name. They have no idea who he is. But uh, the example has endured. Uh, but he was a very pious priest. Um, he would actually would fast every Wednesday and Friday since his youth. And at one point, he made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And along the way, there's a great storm as he's passing through the Mediterranean. And he calmed it by his prayers. Uh, prayed, and that storm was calmed. Now, apparently, um, so he made the pilgrimage. And, you know, who knows what it was for. I suspect it was uh, that he might know the will of God for his life. Uh, why? For on his return... He was passing through uh, the city of Myra, which was not his like home city. That was not his destination. Uh, but at that time, that w- the city was holding an election for their next bishop, and they were at an impasse. They couldn't couldn't come to a consensus, and the council decided that the next priest to enter a certain church was going to be their bishop. And Saint Nicholas, just passing through, uh, entered that very church to pray and then was quickly informed he had just been chosen bishop of the city. <laughs> um, kind of an unexpected, uh, um, you know, tap on your shoulder there, hey, by the way, you're our new bishop. Uh, but, you know, th- he accepted it, right? And, and that would, you can see that, like, well, that seems to be kind of miraculous. Who's going to accept that? Um, perhaps that was exactly why he had gone to Jerusalem on his pilgrimage, right? No accident. I can definitely see this as, look, I've just made a pilgrimage, I've traveled all this way, this must be God's will. And so it was that he, whatever his other plans may have been, all that got dropped, and he accepted the episcopacy here in the city of Myra. Uh, that is what somebody who's open to the will of God does, right? When, when God drops out of the sky and tells you to do something, you, know, you tend to accept it. So. Uh, so he was a great bishop, an excellent bishop. He worked tirelessly, tirelessly to spread the faith through the city, 
uh, displaying concern and zeal for his people. And, and there are all kinds of, of legends and miracles associated with him as bishop in the city, among them uh, raising three, uh, three youths back to life who had been uh, brutally murdered. Uh, there's another one, uh, another three youth story. He rescued them f- from being killed by an unjust accusation. Um, and, you know, so, so we have various legends there. Uh, but something we may not know is that uh, St. Nicholas was imprisoned and tortured for the faith. That was during the Diocletian and the Maximian persecution. Uh, he refused to obey the edict to stop preaching. And so um, he was going to be put to death, but actually before that sentence could be carried out, the emperor Constantine uh, defeated Diocletian at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge and ended the persecutions. His most memorable action uh, came in at the Council of Nicaea, and that was where uh, Arius the heretic actually spoke at that council and was expounding his uh, evil heretical belief that God the Son was not equal to God the Father. This is called the Arianist heresy. And the bishops were, you know, listening patiently to this, I mean, outright blasphemy uh, when St. Nicholas finally decided he couldn't take it anymore and walked right up to him and punched him in the face. Some accounts say it was a slap, uh, but other accounts say that Arius' jaw was permanently disfigured by the blow. That sounds like more than a slap to me. In any case, St. Nicholas uh, was thrown into prison and stripped of his Episcopal garments. Um you know, for acting completely uh, inappropriately, I guess you could say. So they were w- wondering what to do with him, and he was there in humility, or I mean, ra- rather, I mean, he, he was humble, but in humiliation, we could say, uh, thrown in prison by his own fellow bishops. Uh, but that night our Lord and Our Lady appeared to him and asked him why he had been imprisoned, and he said, only because I love you, Lord. And uh, Our Lord and Our Lady gave him back his garments, and in addition, a book of the Gospels. And the next morning they came in and found him in his cell, properly vested and quietly reading the, uh, reading from the Gospels. And so it was, it was seen, okay, nobody else is in here. There's no way this could have happened. Uh, so he was released. Now, <clears throat> you know, these days, this, this is a story which is uh, much, I guess, uh, circulated among traditional circles and much maligned among uh, progressive circles, liberal circles, we could say. Oh, we shouldn't celebrate violence. He shouldn't have done that. That's not even a true story anyways, et cetera, et cetera. Violence is not the answer to our problems. Well, our Lord gave us the example in the Gospels. Sometimes violence is the answer to our problems uh, with the chasing of the money changers out of the temple. Now, there's only one example of many, many others that he gave, uh, but let's not fall into the, the um, error of pacifism, of thinking that violence is never an answer to our problems. There's a reason that we have uh, uh, the just war theory. There's a reason why... Um, the, the church wields power. There's a reason why uh, civil authorities, the church has recognized, they have the, the authority to imprison and even put to death. Yes, the death penalty is uh, allowable by natural law. So, so anger is appropriate because anger is a passion that helps us to do a difficult good. It's one of those things that anger should not be leading us in our actions, but anger can follow a decision. And this is how St. Nicholas would have, would have acted. Right? He didn't jump up right away, but he waited. Right, he considered in his mind: Is violence appropriate? Um, is, is you know what, what's what's going on? After careful consideration, right, he decided it would be just and prudent and effective and proper to display his anger in a physical way. Uh, so it's like, okay, this is a serious thing. This is blasphemy to Almighty God. This is a known point of doctrine, which it was. Uh, this is erroneous. This is a council of the church. Uh, nobody's doing anything. He shouldn't be, you know, being allowed to speak. Um, you know, all these things, you know, could have been. Uh, considerations that St. Nicholas was uh, thinking, was making, and decided that uh, decisive action is needed and this is going to be appropriate. Um, and so he acted. Right? That, that, and, 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 and you need anger to help you do that. Anger is you know, kind of like the authenticity of it um, you know, for a very serious thing. Now, so, and this is different, right? This is different than, the world, than worldly anger. The, 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 the passion of anger as opposed to righteous anger it's, it's not, it's not uh, careful, it's not measured, it's not well thought out, it's not controlled. Uh, that, that is, that is um, the difference between the two, right? As anger leads the reason, uh, somebody, they feel the passion first, and then either they justify it or they don't even think about it, they just act. And worldly anger, uh, we could say, it has characteristics of um, disproportionality. It's excessive to the infringement, uh, or it's not appropriate to the situation. Um, it's selfish, right? It's directed because, and that, this is the biggest thing, right? Uh, selfish anger or worldly anger 
is over a wrong that has been done to me. I'm insulted. I feel slighted. I haven't gotten the respect I deserve, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, righteous anger is about someone else, right? Um, it's about the honor of God, the defense of the truth, and so on. And now it, it, we have to be careful because we can end up angry uh, or feeling personally slighted when the truth is slighted. If somebody insults the truth, I feel insulted. If somebody insults, um, you know, the church or a point of heresy or a, a point of dogma, you know, I can feel personally insulted. So we have to be careful about that, disguising our selfish anger as righteous anger. Uh, but it has to be, there, there, again, there's the element of control. These days, if only we could have more righteous anger, um, you know, with, with the masses being canceled and churches being closed and all the real civil rights violations that are happening, and, and nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care that, you know, our, 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 our um, natural law rights are being violated and taken away from us one by one, and, and, and there's, there's no anger. There's no righteous anger over that, over uh, dishonesty in the press, over just complete corruption in our politics, in our church. I mean, I mean, there's some anger, but there, it really isn't to the degree that it should be. There actually needs to be more anger on the part of faithful uh, Catholics in the world. Now, I don't mean the traditional community. I mean Catholics in general, right? Bishops, those who are in those positions who are not part of the corruption, uh, but this all around them. But there needs to be more anger. There needs to be, there needs to be more of an insistence that this, this cannot be allowed to continue. Uh, so that would be something we could pray to St. Nicholas of Myra for these days, is uh, to inspire those uh, who need it uh, to have more anger, right? to have that righteous anger that, uh, that defends uh, the rights of God, um, the honor of God, and, and the truth. Right? The truth is being attacked. It needs to be defended. And that would be, I think, the great symbol of uh, St. Nicholas is could be the, the, the defender of truth um, using um, um, the, whatever appropriate means are necessary. And we saw he was very generous. He fasted. He prayed. He went on pilgrimages. You know, he gave away money. He was generous. He did all those things, right? The modern world, uh, um, um, you know, sees as good, but he also used violence when it was necessary. And that's a lesson the world needs to learn these days uh, very much indeed. Uh, those who are righteous, I mean, in the church. Physical violence, um, real, real strength uh, sometimes is necessary. And these are the days when that's going to that's gonna be the only thing that, that is needed. So we need courageous priests, especially courageous bishops, uh, filled with that zeal. Uh, so let's pray to St. Nicholas of Myra for that inspiration. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.